Hello, everyone. Welcome to another membership event from Freedom of the Press Foundation. I'm Ryan Rice, the membership coordinator. Uh, today, we'll be hearing from Deputy Director of Digital Security, Olivia Martin, for a Digital Security 101 training. Um, this will last about 90 minutes. You will have the opportunity to participate during the presentation, as well as give feedback and answer a survey in the coming days that I'll send uh, probably next week. Before Olivia begins, I just want to welcome all of our members, uh, both new and returning supporters. This is our first event of 2023. Um, we've got about 150 members now, so we're very excited about that. Um, about 50% of those folks are new um, after our end of year campaign push. So I'm very appreciative of, of all of you. Um, I'll be sitting in on this training today. This is not the first DigiSec 101 I've attended. I'm sure it won't be the last. Uh, I always learn something new. So you're welcome to submit questions real time or uh, email me at membership at freedom.press at any time. So thanks again for joining us today, Olivia. Um, and the floor is yours. Amazing. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction, Ryan. Um, I've been working at Freedom of the Press Foundation for um, six years now doing digital security trainings um, with journalists um, in large newsrooms, small newsrooms, independent ones, uh, with freelancers, documentary filmmakers, academics, researchers, all sorts of folks who um, you know work towards um, free expression and um, transparency and um, public accountability. So um, what we're gonna be doing today is a training very similar to what I would do if I were coming into any old newsroom, um, introducing journalists to some of the foundations of digital security. So ways that they can think about protecting their data, um, at their newsroom or with their research or in communication with sources, for example. So I'll walk us all through the agenda, kind of what to expect in the next um, 85 or so minutes. And uh, as Ryan said, um, participation is fantastic. So um, for all of you who are hanging out live right now, um, the chat is open to you. I'm gonna be asking for a little bit of participation. So um, don't be shy. So let me, without further ado, start doing a little screen share. Okay. Can you all see my Digital Security 101? Yep, that looks great, Olivia. Okay. Let's get going. So I'm going to be shouting out a couple of resources that Ryan will put in the chat and later on in the event description for those of you who are watching at home later um, after today. Um, these resources, uh, for the most part, have been written by myself and my colleagues um, at Freedom of the Press Foundation. Uh, you can find all of those resources and more at our freedom.press slash training page. So that's where all of our guides are. Um, and also where you can find our training request form. So all of our training services, as well as consulting and organizational security auditing, all those are offered on a sliding scale. So cost is never a barrier to receiving these services. Um, and so if you or someone you know is in need of digital security support, while we don't do rapid response, um, certainly reach out and um, we'll set up a time to chat with you about your needs. So today we're going to be talking about two foundations of digital security. Um, first, we will begin with a conversation around risk assessment. So how to identify the data that's really important to you. Um, and then we'll get into those two foundational topics. So the first is account security. Um, what makes a good password? Um, what tools you can use to better protect your online accounts? 
And then we'll talk about secure communications. So how we can use encryption to protect the contents of our messages, especially if they're sensitive and valuable to us. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna get into it. I start every single training, um, you know, myself and my colleagues on the digital security training team, we all start um, any session talking about um, risk assessment. Uh, sometimes it's called uh, threat modeling in, in information security spaces. Uh, the gist of it is um, uh, trying to find, um, you know, a, a framework that you can use to assess um, the data that's most important to you and what are those threats to that data. So um, being able to situate, situate yourself in a complex sort of risk landscape um, allows you to better understand the ideal practices and tools for you because each and every one of us in this room have uh, you know different roles in the world. We operate very differently online. And so each of us are going to have a very different uh, ideal toolkit. Um, and so this is a really good way to ground the rest of the session so that you all can listen to what I'm saying and pick and choose the recommendations that work best for you or the areas for further inquiry based on your own risk assessment. Um, let's try it out uh, by starting with a scenario. So I'm going to, like I said, ask for some participation here. Um, we're going to use, um, you know, a scenario to start teasing out some of the um, core components of a risk assessment framework. So first, let me introduce you to our character in, um, in this scenario. We have April O'Neill, a dogged journalist, um, a reporter at Channel 6 in New York City. Um, April has two uh, you know, uh, areas of specialization in journalism. So these are her two activities um, that she, um, she does most often in her professional life. She covers local crime syndicates in the field. So she's out and about um, uh, working with sources, um, trying to capture footage of, um, you know, crime and, and its aftermath in the big city. Um, and she's also, uh, you know, spending some time behind her desk doing um, research into connections between government and, you know, corporate collusion. Um, and so she's also um, a bit of a, a research and online whiz. So given these two core activities, um, April has some really specific goals when it comes to her digital security. Um, I've listed out three here. So the first is um, given you know, the type of journalism that she does, it's really important for her to be able to communicate securely with her sources and maintain their anonymity if they so wish. Um, another goal that she has is to capture exclusive footage of local vigilantes. So she would like to be able to be out in the field, um, you know, using her mobile phone and a camera, be able to capture footage um, and, and be able to keep that safe um, and, and keep it, um, you know, uh, secured so that only she has access to it while she's working on the story draft so that she gets the exclusive scoop. We also have a third goal, which is to keep her research on corruption private. So essentially she's doing a lot of this browsing on the internet. She doesn't wanna tip off the targets of her investigation while she's doing this research. So that's April. Um, she's gonna have a unique risk assessment. It's probably gonna be different from, from our own. Let's try to think about some of April's digital security priorities now. So I'm just going to have us discuss. Um, so you know, get your fingers ready in the chat. Um, what do you all think? What data does April want to protect? Okay, we have um, from the chat uh, some of April's footage that she's getting in the field. Perfect. Um, anything else that comes to mind? Uh, 
for browsing data? Yes, exactly. So some of that research data, um, the little digital breadcrumbs that she's leaving around um, the internet. Oh, we have some more stuff coming in. <laughs> um, we have, you know, location information about, um, you know, where the turtles are hiding. So in other words, um, what we're kind of concerned about is uh, as, um, as April is out in the field, um, she wants to, um, you know, protect the uh, the identities of some of her anonymous sources, um, and so, you know, some of the field work that she might have could have metadata that could point to the location of, you know, a secret lair, I mean, maybe that's not something that she wants to publish, so that's data that's important for her to protect, um, and so, these are some really, really great ideas. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll show you in my key takeaways, this almost perfectly matches with what I was thinking as well. Um, now we have just the second question in, um, in this scenario that I would like us to discuss as well is who is April concerned about? So we have this data that she's trying to protect, the footage, um, her browsing, some, you know, metadata. We'll talk more about what exactly that means in a few minutes. Um, who might be some of the people that are interested in getting this data? Who is she concerned about um, when thinking about um, picking up new digital security um, skills to protect her data? Who are these potential people? Okay, so we have um, some of the people who, um, you know, want to stop local vigilantes. Um, in this case, it could be, you know, uh, the targets of some of her criminal investigations. Um, you know, these are kind of where some of her, her vigilante sources might be overlapping with, um, you know, crime syndicates. So, um, this could be someone who's really interested in getting some of her field footage. Um, law enforcement could certainly be a, a group of people who, you know, might be interested in getting some of that um, research data that April is, is using to make connections between, you know, city officials and um, dark criminal organizations or dark corporations. Um, so these are, um, you know, two groups of really powerful people that April is going to come up against. And so she's going to have to build that into her defensive strategy. Thank you all for your participation. It's great. You can see here, it's pretty much exactly what I was thinking. Um, so, uh, you know, the data that she has to, she wants to protect is, you know, some footage, some communication information, her browsing history, if she's taking um, interviews, where we're thinking about those recordings and those transcripts. And ding, 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 who is she concerned about? Local criminal leaders, um, city officials, essentially like the targets of her investigation, or the people who are interested in unmasking um, some of her anonymous sources. Um, we also, in some cases, might may be thinking about um, you know intermediaries. So some of the platforms that she might be using for communication or storing her footage you know, those could be avenues for some of these bad actors to, um, to get some of her valuable data. So this is also a consideration that April wants to take and keep in mind when she's choosing the right tool for the job. So these two questions that I asked you about, you know, what data April's concerned about, um, or want, what, what data she wants to protect and who she's concerned about. These are actually the first two questions in any risk assessment, um, at least uh, you know when we're just getting started with digital security. And so when we're asking uh, what data do I have to protect, we call this our assets. Um, when we're asking who am I concerned about, who um, you know who would be interested in this data, we call those our adversaries. So we've now started to uncover um, the beginnings of a risk assessment for April. And this is something that I encourage you to think about for your own selves um, as you're uh, you know, thinking through the rest of the recommendations that, um, that I'll be covering today.
So now that we've thought about identifying adversaries, now it's really, really useful, I think, to think about what are these adversaries capable of? You know, um, a local, uh, you know, a leader, criminal leader is going to be using different tactics than um, someone who, a corrupt city official. Um, there may be some overlap, of course, but because these two groups have different resources available to them, they're capable of different um, tactics. And so this is a really useful component in thinking through a digital security plan. So um, one of the metaphors that we like to use when talking to journalists about um, adversarial capability and what tactics they may be coming up against um, when thinking through their own risk assessment is this front versus back door um, dichotomy. So um, let's think of a house that is, you know, where we store all of our assets. Now, an adversary could um, kind of take two ways to enter the house um, in order to get these assets. Let me talk through what I mean here. So someone could knock on the front door and ask to, um, to enter. They could knock on the front door, maybe with a legal request, like a warrant in order to enter. Or another pathway for them to enter the house and get these assets would be through the back door, through breaking in, through using more um, criminal, nefarious tactics um, in order to get those assets. So um, let me talk through what this could look like in, um, you know, grounded in more digital security thinking. So um the sort of backdoor tactics that we're thinking about when we're considering our digital security are um, the ones that involve um, things like uh, account hacking um you know uh um uh let's say like what the hacker in in the corner of the of the cafe is doing trying to you know um, observing what's going on on the the shared cafe network um, and these are more, um, these are the sort of tactics that are um, more tied to our, our lawless um, sort of adversaries. So this is when we're thinking about back to April's risk assessment, we're thinking about um, the tactics that, you know, the local crime lords are capable of. Um, these are also potentially the types of adversaries, you know, in real life that could, you know, escalate to more physical um, forms of intimidation in order to get data as well. Now, thinking about front door. Um, so these are the sorts of um, tactics that adversaries who have, you know, the legal standing to send, um, you know, legal requests for um, user data. Um, this is how, um, what we see in more, um, sort of like court proceedings where, um, legal requests are made to the platforms that we trust with our data. Um, and those legal requests may, um, if they're compelling enough, may result in the platform that, um, that has our data, um, uh, to, to hand it over. Of course, there are you know, caveats galore. It depends on your jurisdiction. It depends on your risk assessment. Um, but this is one way of thinking through um, and simplifying uh, you know, what tactics you may be approaching. Um, because uh, if I'm concerned about more front door tactics, then I'm going to start to look for maybe finding a, ways to store my data um, that wouldn't be vulnerable to a legal request. This is just one way of thinking through um, the third question in our risk assessment. What are my adversaries capable of? So regardless of who we are on the internet, um, the types of journalism that we do, um, the other sort of uh, module that I always um, offer in a 101 like this is around account security. Um, and the reason why is that uh, having a very good practice around protecting your online accounts is applicable no matter what your risk assessment is. Um, any sort of, um, a lot of times, uh, 
the um, one of the entry points to some of our most valuable data, our most valuable assets, um, is through our our online accounts. We have our you know our email accounts that are you know um, that we sign into using a username and password. We have our cloud storage accounts where all of our backups are, um, and so. Um, when we're thinking about having, um, you know, a strong account security practice, what we're trying to um, sort of uh, solve or mitigate are would be the impact of, you know, two um, tactics that come up time and time again um, in many different risk assessments, and that is um, phishing and account hacking. So I'm going to talk about mitigations for both of those tactics. Now, when I'm in these sorts of trainings, uh, I get this question a lot. Um, account hacking, how does it actually happen? What is the, um, you know, how does it actually, um, you know, how does it originate? Um, let's kind of take one case study and um, just a warning. This will culminate in a little pop quiz in just a couple slides. So keep your ears open. So this is an example, um, you know, a real life example published in um, Vice's motherboard um, from I believe 2019. Um, this is a story written by Joseph Cox and Samantha Cole. Um, and it's about users of ring cameras, um, which are, you know, home surveillance cameras, uh, who had uh, their their Ring camera accounts hacked, um, and the folks that were behind this um, this hack were, you know, trolls who were trying to just like cause chaos. Um, and what I want to ask is, you know, how this hack actually happened. So one of the reasons why um, you know people might use these home surveillance cameras is because they're they're quite convenient. Um, the way they work is that you you know you purchase this camera, you set it up wherever you want, whether that's your front door. Um, you know, in this case, in this um, slide that we see right here, a family set this camera up in their kids' um, uh, bedroom. So that they could, um, when they were out of town or sorry, like out of their home, they would be able to, um, you know, sign in through their Ring camera account and, you know, no matter where they were located, make sure that their kids were safe, you know, check in on their kids while they were in the other room, for example. And so um, this is incredibly convenient. But it also means that if someone is able to um, hack into your Ring camera, they can also view those feeds from you know anywhere, um, uh, anywhere that they like, so long as they have an internet connection. So, um, in this case, we had um, you know uh, these sort of trolls going in and um, hacking into these Ring camera accounts, and uh, you know one example here is that. Uh, uh, one of the hackers, you know, was activating the microphone to interact with kids in these homes and these private spaces, playing, you know, creepy songs. Um, and, you know, ultimately, um, this is a, a huge invasion of, of privacy and in a place that you're meant to feel safe. Um, and it was all accomplished through account hacking. Scary stuff. So what I want to ask you all um is what you think um happened here how do you and i'll, I'll tell you the answer we'll we'll get into it um but i want to hear your guesses first how did hackers get into ring cameras um i'm going to list our um our options here and um we'll take a poll in the chat and and see what folks think so um option a um hacking the owner's wi-fi network Option B, advanced NSO group um, cyber weapons like Pegasus. Um, option C, viruses on the camera owner's computer. Or option D, a non-unique password. So those of you who are um, in the chat, um, uh, pop in your question. Um, pop in the letter to the question that, that you think is um, uh, the correct answer.
Okay, we have some answers coming in. We have a, um, uh, a, uh, a D, we have, we have a couple Ds, we have an A. Uh, we have a question about whether, you know, Bluetooth um, could be at play and kind of its overall security. We might have to put that in the parking lot for the end of the session. But um, let's see, a couple of you were right. The answer in this case was, um, you know, hackers were able to get into these ring cameras because um, the, the folks that were targeted were using non-unique passwords on their ring camera accounts. So what does that mean exactly? Um, when, uh, you know, uh, there are some places on the internet where, um, bad actors, adversaries, um, may, uh, may go to, you know, buy um, databases of um, previously used passwords. So when we hear in the news about um, uh, platforms, services that we use um, that, you know, suffered a massive data breach and hackers walked away with, you know, millions of usernames and passwords, um, oftentimes those hackers will go back and resell those sets of um, uh, known passwords. Um, the reason why is because they're banking on the fact that um, uh, humans, uh, because they are um, you know, not infallible, um, may reuse that same password on that breach service um, on another account, such as their Ring camera account. And so um, in the case of this, uh, um, this set of Ring camera account hackings, um, uh, this is kind of what happened. Uh, there was uh, a piece of software that was also available for purchase, very inexpensive um, in these sort of um, dark marketplaces um, that were going through sets, data sets of, or um, yeah, data sets of known um, compromised passwords and trying to find um, uh, um, opportunities for matches between um, a username and a, um, a previously um, compromised password. And so, um, you know, uh, these ring camera hackers would, would just, you know, purchase this piece of software, let it run and wait and see if they got um, matches back. Then they can just go in, um, log in through a ring camera with that username and, um, and password, reuse password. And voila, um, they were um, they were able to log in and perform a lot of this, you know, chaotic, um, you know, uh, infringement on privacy um, that we saw in the previous slides. So, going back to adversarial capability, um, you know, this sort of attack. Well, it does take some technical sophistication. You need to know where to look. You need to know how to use these tools. Um, it was very, very inexpensive. Um, the software that I mentioned that's kind of doing, making these guesses against compromised and reused passwords only cost six US dollars. Um, it also was able to make multiple guesses, um, you know, in, in very quick succession. So uh, it, do it doesn't take a lot of time to, um, to kind of pull off this particular hack. So, this is why, again, um, I always say, no matter who you are on the internet, having a good practice of protecting your online accounts is always going to be important because anyone, um, you know, many of our adversaries are capable of something like this. So how do we avoid this? Um, before I get into some of uh, this password protection, some, some of these solutions, does anyone have questions um, on what we've covered so far or anything that they'd like clarified about that case study that we just went over? All right, well, let's just get to some of these solutions. And if more questions come up, feel free to ask. So 
Um, I just I keep telling you that this is really important, but let me give you some numbers to 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 back up uh, you know the the importance of protecting our our accounts. Eighty nine percent of um, data breaches originate in some form of account hacking. So, um, you know, this is uh, data from uh, the 2021 Verizon DBIR report. And, um, you know, is, uh, is you know, uh, remains to be a, a statistic that is either like pretty, pretty consistent or, or, or growing. So this is a lot of times where um, adversaries will start when they're trying to get access to data. Um, also, there's just, you know, beyond give me giving you statistics, there is, um, you know, uh, the, the fact that human beings, we are not machines. Um, we are, um, uh, we are animals with preferences and a desire for simplicity um, in some cases. So, we, um, you know, naturally are inclined to use um, passwords that are easy for us to remember, or maybe, you know, passwords that we've been using for a very long time. Um, when we're signing up for a new account, it's like, ah, oh, I guess I'll just use that same one that I've been using for 10 years. Um, and, you know, that's just like a, a nature of, um, of psychology as well. So, all I'm saying is uh, sometimes we need the help of, of a tool to get us to start using unique passwords on all of our accounts so that, um, you know, we're mitigating the possibility that an, a hack like this ring camera um, hack could happen to us. So how can we generate and store unique passwords for everything? You can use a tool um, called a password manager. Um, I'm curious in the chat um, if you feel like sharing. Um, is anyone using a password manager? Um, if so, what are you using? What we have here on the on this slide are you know three of our recommendations for really um, uh, uh, um, yeah, for <laughs> three of our recommendations for password managers. These are tools that um, securely generate and store all all of our passwords for us. And so um, for those of you who are maybe not using a password manager right now, but have been in the practice of, let's say, using your browser to you know, store and autofill your passwords in when you're logging into um, accounts online, they work really similarly. In particular, the online password managers that we have, those first two bullets, um, one password and Bitwarden, they are very, very convenient to use and do have, you know, this autofill um, uh, convenience that, that we're very accustomed to um, uh, on, on the internet. So we have, um, we also, we have some uh, fellow 1Password users in the chat. Um, we also have someone who mentions that they use LastPass, which is another very good um, password manager. Um, and then we have, we also have a question about, um, you know, is it is it okay to use um, uh, our our browser to store our passwords? Um, so, for example, um, if you're a Chrome user, um, you know, storing your passwords there and and having Chrome autofill for you when you're logging in. Um, so uh, there's a, it's a it's a yes and no. A, it depends, as is often the answer in um, in digital security. Um, generally, I think that um, uh, what password managers offer are um, additional security features that um, something like your browser's um, uh, autofill just cannot, um, does not offer. So um, with something like 1Password, um, as well as Bitwarden, these online password managers, they have you know, all the same features but they can also allow you to securely share passwords, store secure notes, um, and um, you know, create shared spaces for teammates as well to um, you know, securely share credentials and, um, and access to, to other really critical services. So um, I always think that in particular, if you're thinking about um, your organization security, 
using a password manager is really, really useful. Um, uh, more, more useful and more secure than um, what, uh, what a browser can offer. So we also have, um, I mentioned KeePass XC as well. This is a, another one that we recommend and one that I use as well. Um, uh, this is where uh, uh, I keep my most secure passwords or my most valuable passwords because it works completely offline. Um, and so all that I'm responsible, my responsibility is to keep that offline file, um, you know, very secure, this database of all of my passwords. Um, and ultimately, it's my responsibility to maintain that. Um, I'm not, I don't have to, you know, trust, um, you know, the cloud in order to, uh, to, um, uh, to be a space to, to store some of those passwords. But it really, it's like, it's just going back to, again, your risk assessment. Um, if you haven't started using a password manager yet, I highly recommend 1Password. It is very, very user-friendly. Um, and, uh, you know, while there is a subscription cost for, um, or so yeah, subscription cost for, you know, uh, most users, um, it's, it's, it's a small fee. It's worth the investment, but Bitwarden is free and open source. So um, another really good starting place as well. So this is one example of um, one password um, generating a completely random password. Um, so we can see on the top right, this random string of letters um, and numbers or this random string of words. Um, let's say if I wanted to be able to read aloud type or memorize um, a random password, that's when I'd go for something like a string of random words. Now um, I generate that password, I save it, and um, or I click save and one password saves that entry for me. So for the next time that I'm logging into Twitter, as is in this, um, this overview, um, one password is going to say, hey, I know I have an entry for one password. And um, would you like me to, to log in with that credential? Um, as easy as pie. Um, and uh, very similarly, this is KeePass XC, um, generating a string of random words. Um, so we're seeing, you know, in real time, uh, what some of these really secure and random and unique passwords look like. Um, this is way better than using, um, you know, something like password one, two, three, or whatever it is that we've been using um, as our, our backup password for, for years and years. So um, just to bring this all, all home, what does a password manager have that I don't? Um, you know, I'm, I have my own solution for passwords, convince me that I need to change. So here are some of the value adds for something for a tool like a password manager. Um, they, uh, you know, do the job of um, generating and storing these random passwords for us, which is really nice. Um, they also um, have shared vaults. Um, so these are spaces, especially if you're working with a team. Um, and you want to be able to share access to, let's say, the same social media account. Multiple people need to log in and post, and you're all, you know, working from different devices. You need a, a way to easily and securely share that login. Um, password managers will do that for you. Very, very, very useful for teams. Password managers also, um, uh, you know, one password does this. Um, uh, they have these additional features to let you know, hey, um, you're using the same password on multiple accounts, or we just learned um, of a, you know, um, a massive uh, breach of one of the services that you use. This could mean that hackers might have that uh, that password that you. Um, that you set on, on that account. How about you um, change that password so they won't be able to log in as you? So these are all sorts of features that I think are really, really beneficial um, for just about anyone. So uh, before I move into um, the final component of our account security, 
uh, module. Does anyone have questions about password managers? Has anyone tried using one and run into challenges and, and maybe needs a, um, uh, some useful tips? So we do have a question in the chat. Um, uh, we have someone who's using KeyPass XC, which is an offline password manager. How often, um, the question is, how often should I be backing up um, that, um, that password manager, or sorry, um, your, um, your KeyPass XC database, um, uh, just so that you have an extra copy? Um, because it's offline, it's not automatically, um, you know, uh, backing up or syncing across devices. So this is this is where some of the um, the manual um, component comes in. Whereas our online password managers have much more convenience built in um, because they sync across devices and you can retrieve them no matter what um, because it's you know uh, backed up encrypted um, to a cloud service. So um, when it comes to having a good practice of backing up your, um, your offline password manager, um, I have, uh, you know, there's no perfect formula here. Um, I have a regular uh, calendar um, reminder every, um, every two months to back up to um you know an encrypted external storage device um a new uh, a new backup of my my offline password manager um that's because you know every couple of months i'm probably signing up for something new um but it just depends on how you use it um uh, this is just in the case that you know there's like a catastrophic um, failure of, of your computer and you want to be able to restore to the most recent version of your, your password database. You don't wanna to have to lose anything in between. So it really just depends on how often you're updating that, um, that offline password manager. Um, we also have a question. Um, I have so many passwords I need to update, but I never have time. What should I do? Aha, so this is where one of those security features I just mentioned um, really come in handy. So um, uh, something like 1Password, um, a service like this will tell you, okay, um, you know, uh, we see that you are reusing a password, you know, this password on this many um, accounts. Um, and this password on this many accounts. Um, so they'll let you know how much password reuse um, and they'll list the, the accounts that do require further action so that you have you know, unique and um, you know, robust passwords on all of your um, accounts eventually. But you know, we only have so many hours in the day and we have to prioritize other tasks, of course. So um, you can, just use these um, these notifications on something like one password to, as you have time, um, make those changes. Um, so it'll keep this running list um, so that you you ostensibly have a to do list. And um, you know, I always recommend getting it to it sooner rather than later. But there's, um, like I said, so many hours in the day. So I, I in your case, um, for um, for those of you who are asking similar questions, that's when I would go towards um, a, a password manager like One Password because I have that additional alert feature, so that you can, you know, um, incrementally go through overhauling your your account security practice. Awesome questions, thank you all. All right, so let's say that um, you've, uh, you know signed up for a password manager, you now have unique passwords on all your accounts, you are a pro at this. Um, what's the next step that you should take to protect your online accounts? What is this final component um, that I wanna focus on account security? So I'm going to talk about this component through the lens of phishing. So um, I wanna use this case study um where um a from 2016 this is a report from the citizen lab um and it is about um, an egyptian lawyer who was arrested in 2016 um, and shortly after her arrest 
um, members of her, her address book um, received an email that was purported to have um, a Dropbox link to her arrest warrant. So um, what we find out later, um, you know, uh, is that that um, email was um, a phishing email. It was maliciously crafted to try to um, incentivize the recipients of that email to hand over, um, you know, valuable assets. In this case, a Dropbox username and password. But I want to walk you all through what this um, uh, what this email looked like, so that we can start to identify some of the um, you know clear red flags that um, a message we're receiving is a phishing message. So here's the 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 email that um, members of this um, uh, lawyer's sort of social network or, or social net um, received. Um, does anyone here, um, any of my participants, do you see anything that's particularly fishy? Um, what I will add is that, um, you know, this um, uh, file name that ends in the .pdf file extension, um, you, uh, if you're um, not an Arabic speaker, um, just so uh, so that you, you have all the context you need, um, this essentially says, you know, um, arrest warrant. So this is, um, again, like the message that's saying you are being shared an arrest warrant um, via this Dropbox link. If you want to view the file, click this button. So, um, okay, so we have in the chat that, um, you know, let's take a look at this from um, a section on the top left of this email. It says that um, this message is coming from a Gmail account. Hmm. Now, why the heck would Dropbox be sending me an email from a Gmail account? Um, that's not the service that we're expecting to receive um, messaging from, um, from you know, a Dropbox, which, which is a Google competitor. And, um, you know, is, uh, you know, anyone can sign up for a Gmail account. It is not a sort of um, a particular privilege. So, this means that it could be anyone on the internet um, who, you know, just created this account and named it whatever they wanted. In this case, dropbox.noreplay at gmail.com, which is another thing that was pointed out in the chat. Um, no replay. Um, maybe this um, sounds just a bit off because sometimes in, um, you know, official um, emails from platforms, we will see, you know, no reply. Um, oftentimes come up in, in an email address. So um, no re replay could be either a, um, a typo or um, a deliberate choice in order to av avoid um, you know, spam filtering. Not exactly sure in this case, um, but regardless, it's not what, what we're looking for when we're um, trying to identify um, a legitimate email. So this is another flag that this is probably an illegitimate one. So um, that being said, um, you know, I'm receiving this email. I am under duress. I'm worried about my friend who I just learned was arrested. Um, I, I'm feeling, you know, the social pressure to view file, to click view file. So if I did that, I was brought to this website. Um, that's asking me to log in to my Dropbox account. Um, is anything here, I'm jumping out at folks as um, fishy. So something that, you know, uh, that always catches my eye is the login, um, the sort of the design here. Um, so if you recall, I mentioned that this is from 2016. Um, back in 2016, uh, this is almost exactly, um, you know, where this sort of username and password field, um, you know, is on, on this web, on this web page. It looks almost exactly like the login experience for a Google account. 
this is not what it looked like to log into Dropbox back in 2016. Um, so this is, um, you know, this malicious login page has just st um, stolen the, um, the design elements from a Google login page. Um, that's, a, that's a big red flag. Um, we also have this URL here. Um, there's a trick of the eye that's happening. Um, we, if we're reading left to right, it says Dropbox support .serve -http .com. Um, What's happening here is that we are visiting a subdomain of the serve um, website called named Dropbox support. So the people who were behind this phishing campaign purchased a serve HTTP domain from a, you know, a, a domain a registrar. And, um, and when you own a domain, you can name and create as many subdomains as you like. So um, in this way, um, you can create the Dropbox support domain. And based on the way that URLs are crafted, um, uh, what you're going to read first on the left-hand side is the name of the subdomain. So again, this is all trying to fool people who may be stressed and, and trying to um, uh, help out a friend who, who they're concerned about. Um, you know, we also see that this website, um, it, we're not connected. It's not an encrypted connection. There's no HTTPS here. Um, so this is another indicator that something is fishy. So we have a lot going on here. Um, the um, unfortunate thing here, and something that I mentioned, is just because of the of the pressure and the fact that people who received this message were under duress. Um, this was a very successful campaign, um, phishing campaign back in 2016, and um, the people who were behind this phishing campaign were able to harvest the usernames and passwords of a lot of um, the people that they targeted. Um, uh, and when it comes to the username and password for your Dropbox account, for many people, it's a place where you store some very valuable assets. So um, this was very, very successful um, uh, from the adversary's perspective. So what are some things that uh, to look out for? Um, like we mentioned, typos and bad grammar, URLs that have no connection to the service, social pressure, social pressure, social pressure. And then what we didn't see in this example, but is um, indicative of, you know, many phishing campaigns um, would be unsolicited attachments, you know, download this thing, um, open up this link. Um, and, and so these are ways that um, the people who are behind phishing campaigns are trying to get you to um, uh, give up, you know, confidential information or passwords, um, assets that are valuable to you. So what's a way that we can, even if we fall for a fish, um, stop the adversary dead in their tracks before they can even get into our account and get a hold of those valuable assets. Um, the preventative measure that we want to take here is to set up and enable two-factor authentication on as many accounts as we possibly can. Um, so kind of uh, if, if two-factor authentication seem, feels like a new term for you, um, oftentimes, even if we don't know it by name, we've experienced it before. Let's say we're logging on to, um, you know, uh, to do some online banking. And um, our bank, you know, we're logging in with our username and password and our bank says, okay, we're going to send you a text message. We're going to, or we'll, we'll email you a code um, before you can fully log in and start accessing, you know, all this stuff behind your account. We need you to verify that you've received that code. Essentially, like we need to verify that you are who you say you are. You're not just, um, you know, a remote attacker, a remote adversary that has this person's username and password. And so um, the reason why two-factor authentication is really, really useful in these cases um, of, you know, account hacking and phishing is that um, your second factor, um, you know, where you receive this, um, this random code is tied to a physical thing that only you have access to. So this mobile phone that's receiving, um, you know, the text message with that code, for example. So let me tell you more about um, how this works. So 
this is an example of, you know, a login um, experience um, to a Google account once you've enabled two-factor authentication. So very familiar. We're putting in our username and password. That's what's happening on the left-hand side. And then um, because we've um, enabled two-factor authentication, Google is saying, okay, um, you know, I, I want to verify you are who you say you are. Give me that second factor. Um, I'm going to ask you for that phone number that you registered um, uh, with. And um, once you enter that phone number, we're going to send you this code. Um, if you are really the person who owns this account and the phone number, tell us what that code is, that six-digit code. Um, once you enter that six-digit code that you receive via text, then you can get into your Google account. So if I were an attacker who maybe, you know, fished your, your, um, your Google account password from you, I could get into, I could finish step one, but step two and step three would be really tricky for me to pull off. So this is how you can, you know, thwart remote attackers um, who are trying to hack or fish. So um, I mentioned, you know, text message as a way to receive the second factor. Um, it's not the most secure method to receive our two factor, our second factor code. Um, I always say that some two factor is better than none. But um, when we're trying to, um, you know, whenever possible, I would recommend you opt for um, another method. So um, I would recommend opting for um, using, enabling two-factor authentication through a mobile app. So essentially, instead of waiting for a text message, waiting to receive a text message, um, you um, set up a mobile application to, you know, generate these codes offline. And whenever you are asked for your second factor, you pick up your phone, you open up that authenticator app, and, um, and you look for the entry for the service that you're hoping to log into. So we see that happening here on the right-hand side is, um, you know, uh, this is what Google Authenticator looks like. Um, as it um, for, you know, it's set up with three different accounts in this case. That's why we have these three separate entries. And, um, and we see that uh, this code is, you know, generating a new one every, you know, um, every about 30 seconds. So this is, um, you know, my preferred version um, of two-factor authentication. Um, Google Authenticator is free to use. Um, there's also um, free OTP, which is also um, uh, works nearly identically um, to Google Authenticator. Um, it's also open source. So um, then we have la creme de la creme of a two-factor authentication method. So this is our security key. This is the most secure method of receiving or of, you know, um, setting up two-factor authentication. So it's something that we um, frequently recommend to, you know, very high-risk um, journalists and activists. Um, and it's something that, you know, I, I also use as well. Um, so uh, with security keys, um, the um, your second factor is tied to a, a piece of hardware. Um, it oftentimes looks like a USB key, and you insert it into your device, whether that's a laptop or a computer or a mobile phone. They have different attachments, um, and uh, and that is. Um, uh, what the service will use um, to um, to verify that you are who you say you are, because you are the only one who has access to this security key that you set up with this account. Um, so there are a couple different vendors who um, uh, produce security keys. Um, YubiKey is one of them. Um, and uh, if you want to learn more about them, definitely shoot me an email and I'm, I'm happy to, to talk more about the virtues of security keys. Um, uh, also what I'll have Ryan put in our chat is um, a list of resources around account security. So how to choose the right password manager for you, um, how to set up two-factor authentication, two-factor authentication for beginners, 
Um, these are the perfect ways for you to not only um, re-familiarize yourself with some of these concepts, but actually implement some of these changes. Um, and again, if you want more support, um, uh, I will share my email at the end of this and, um, and you can reach out and I can help you as best I can. Um, assuming that, uh, <laughs> that my, <laughs> my inbox isn't screaming at me too loud. Um, so before I move on to secure communications, are there any questions on two-factor authentication? Any challenges that people have had? All righty. At least I got a chance to take a sip. Um, oops, that's not... We're going to skip over browsing privacy, excuse me, and go straight to secure communications. I'll come back and do another um, member event on browsing privacy. How does that sound? So let's talk about how, you know, just on a basic level, how um, the contents of our messages are protected with this thing called encryption. So um, most of the communications platforms that we use every day, or protect, um, um, protect the contents of our messages um, with uh, something called in-transit encryption. So that means that as our messages, like in this diagram here, this hello, um, it's being sent from one endpoint, one device on the left-hand side, to this other endpoint on the right-hand side, this other mobile phone. Um, as it's in transit between um, the device um, through the service provider and then routed from the service provider, whatever uh, application we're using to communicate um, on its way to, um, you know, the intended recipient, this device on the right hand side, um, the content of that hello, that message is um, is encrypted. And so what does that actually mean? Like where where, where is the protection actually coming in? Um, what it means is that uh, the content of that message is completely unintelligible to anyone who is snooping on the network in between these, you know, three junctures. So um, anyone who's hanging out on this network here or on, you know, my, uh, you know, the person that I'm messaging their network, um, they might see that I'm having a, a conversation with this person, but they won't be able to see the content of what I'm saying. They'll just see a bunch of scrambled um, letters and numbers. I'll show you more of that um, uh, in, in just a moment. That being said, when we're using a platform that supports in-transit encryption, which is great, our third parties, um, anyone who's snooping on the network, we don't want them to know what we're saying. Still not a confidential conversation. And that's because our service provider, um, this actor in the middle, still technically is able to view the contents of our messages. So that means, you know, going back to our risk assessment, if we're concerned about maybe legal requests to our service provider for our, you know, our message content, um, this is when we want to look for platforms, for alternative platforms. But before we talk about some of those more secure alternatives, um, I want to tell you about some of the platforms that, um, you know, uh, that we rely on on a day-to-day -day basis um, that support in-transit encryption. So like I said, it's most of the platforms that we use and, um, you know, such as our traditional email services, um, team uh, messaging services, such as Slack or Microsoft Teams, um, as well as social media DMs, um, such as, um, you know, Twitter DMs, Instagram, Facebook Messenger. So, um, you know, this is, uh, in-transit encryption is very, very good at cutting out third parties, but the platform itself still does have, technically has visibility into these conversations. So when we want more, um, when we want to have, um, when we want to cut out, you know, the, the platform, cut, cut out the middleman, but still have a conversation, we want to look for platforms instead that support end-to-end -end encryption. So this is why I mentioned that endpoint 
um, uh, um, vocabulary in our last diagram. And uh, when we're thinking through, through these scenarios, our endpoints are the devices that send and receive messages using, you know, an end-to-end -end encrypted platform or, you know, any, um, any platform. So um, when we're using a service that supports end-to-end -end encryption, that the contents of our messages are encrypted between endpoints. And so only at the endpoints can, um, the, can the message content be read. So now not only um, are we cutting the network snoops out of the conversation, we're also cutting the service provider, the platform itself out of the conversation. They're sending a message from point A to point B, but they can't read it. It's a bunch of scrambled text. So what are some of our most popular end-to-end um, -end encrypted chat apps? There are a lot out there. Um, there are a lot of ways to have an end-to-end -end encrypted conversation. Um, I'm gonna focus just because of time on, um, on two that, um, that many of the journalists that, that we work with rely on. Um, the first is Signal, um, and the second is WhatsApp. So um, let's talk more about encryption. I mentioned, um, you know, content is scrambled. You know, um, anyone who, you know, can't decrypt um, a, a message will just see a bunch of scrambled, you know, uh, letters and numbers, this, um, this gobbledygook. This is exactly what I mean in this screenshot. So this is an example of what encrypted content looks like to someone who's not at the endpoints. So whether that's the service provider or someone who's snooping on, um, you know, on a network where this conversation is happening, they can't see what these two people are saying to each other, can they? Um, but they do have a bit of visibility into this conversation and that's through metadata. So what I mean by that is, you know, some of these artifacts around the content, such as, you know, um, I know that Harlow Holmes and Rose Duper are talking to each other. I also see a timestamp here. So um, I know that they were speaking to one another at 2.05 PM. Can also see, um, you know, a subject line as well. So um, while I don't know what these two are saying to each other, I can still make out, um, you know, some of the contours of what's going on. So all of this is to say that end-to-end um, -end encryption and just like encryption in general is amazing and so fantastic, essential for press freedom um, and journalism but it is not magic. Um, there are um, additional considerations that we want to keep in mind when we are thinking about what is the right platform for um, a given conversation. One of the questions is about how the platform handles our metadata. How much of it are they harvesting? Because um, depending on the platform, the answer is different. So, you know, I can tell you, you know, in some cases, this is the best option, but uh, like I said as well, way earlier, we all have different risk assessments. So, um, you know, the best option is going to be different for each of us, and it's going to be different for each of us in different scenarios as well. So I want to give you some of the questions that I ask and that when, you know, my team is consulting with journalists, like, um, some of the questions that we use to get to the bottom of, you know, the right digital security plan, the right communications plan. So let's complicate our risk assessment. <laughs> the first question that we may ask, and I'll use case studies in comparing Signal and WhatsApp to sort of give you an idea of how I help people um, and how I help myself when trying to make an informed decision. So um, the first is about access and willingness because um, you know both of the parties, let's say we're having, I'm trying to have a conversation, a sensitive conversation with one other person. Both of us need to have access to um, an application, an end-to-end -end encrypted application in order to have this conversation in the first place. If this person can't download the app because of where they're located or because of you know, bandwidth issues, 
then I'm going to have to look for an alternative. I'm going to have to see maybe what app they already have downloaded um, and go from there. So, um, and do they feel comfortable using it, um, downloading it in the first place? You need to meet people where they are oftentimes. So um, when I think about WhatsApp versus Signal, we have, you know, the fact that WhatsApp has such a huge user base. Um, it has, um, this is as of 2020, it was used by over like roughly, and I, I, I don't know the exact numbers now, but 2 billion users worldwide. Um, by comparison, um, while Signal has a has quite a large user base, you know, tens of millions of, of users as of 2021, um, depending on, uh, it, it still has, you know, a, a smaller user base than WhatsApp. So um, if I'm trying to have a conversation with someone, there's a higher likelihood that they have WhatsApp and that they've used it before and they feel comfortable with with it. So if that's something that's very important to, let's say, my source, um, having access and feeling comfort, then um, this might be um, a reason for moving from Signal to WhatsApp when I'm trying to think through the right option. We also have, in terms of access, um, the fact that um, depending on the region, depending on the political climate and the platform in question, um, some uh, platforms may be either censored or, um, you know, geo-blocked from being downloaded. So you also need to keep that access question really front of mind, um, especially when working with people in different political and geographic contexts than you. So, um, you know, while Signal is, um, uh, you know, historically, um, as of this recording has you know, faced a, a fair amount of censorship um, in, in certain regions, um, WhatsApp uh, experiences fewer um, uh, uh, instances of censorship or um, service downtime. So it can be, it's more oftentimes more readily available. So that being said, there are other questions that I definitely want to ask beyond that. Um, and the first is, or th this other question is, you know, will my adversary send a legal request to the tool provider? Like, is my adversary capable of that? Um, and also, you know, what is the platform's track record when responding to legal requests? Um, do, do, am I able to, um, based off of their, their history, understand, you know, how trustworthy, um, uh, the platform is when they say that they're um, they're doing their due diligence to to protect me from you know um, unnecessary legal requests or something along those lines. So um, let's talk through some of what we know about Signal versus WhatsApp. Um, Signal, uh, you know, has a, a page on their website where they disclose every government request that they've had to comply with. Um, as of 2023, they have five reported. Um, these are, you know, the instances that they are, you know, um, at liberty to share. Um, so I can't, um, you know, I am not a lawyer and I cannot, um, you know, speak to um, the holistic accuracy of this, um, but we can, you know, uh, make some, uh, some inferences, at least when comparing, you know, what we know about Signal versus, um, what we know about um, WhatsApp's parent company, Meta. Um, so this is from Meta's transparency report. And while these statistics are about, you know, all of their properties and how many legal requests they receive from state actors, um, we can see just by the numbers. Um, so this is from a, a six month period in 2022. Meta responded, um, you know, to tens of thousands of legal requests for, you know, um, user data, and in about 88% of those cases, they were able to hand over some data. Now, this is where the metadata question comes in, um, because uh, now I know a bit more about how these tool providers, um, you know, what their track record is um, when it comes to legal requests and how they respond to them. But it's also a question of 
what they can um, hand over if they are compelled to respond to a legal request. Um, because, uh, you know, while the, you know, if we're using an end-to-end -end encrypted application, while content is not something that um, the platform has access to, they might have a lot of metadata to hand over. So I want to ask about this third question. If they have to respond, how much metadata can they hand over? So this is from WhatsApp's privacy policy. Um, you know, uh, WhatsApp um, collects a fair amount of metadata about users. So um, the phone number you use to register this, your account with, um, if you choose to upload your contacts, um, they um, have access to all of that. Um, and then a lot of usage and activity information as well. So this is like timestamps on messages, um, excuse me, contacts in um, active chats, contacts in group chats. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, like duration of calls, um, other things like this. So while WhatsApp doesn't have visibility into um, the the actual substance, the content of what's being said on their platform, they have a lot of visibility into all the activity around it, which can be very, very um, revealing to an investigator if that's kind of what we're concerned about in our risk assessment. On the other hand, Signal um, collects a very sparse amount of metadata um, on users. And this has been tested in the court. Um, and um, when they do have to comply with legal requests, um, the only information that they have to disclose are three pieces of metadata. Um, the phone number they use to register your account, um, the date that you set up your, um, your Signal account, and the last time you opened up you know, uh, you, your your device pinged Google's or sorry, Signal's server. So the last time you opened up the app to check for new messages, that's it. Nothing about they don't have access to your contacts list. They don't have um, timestamps on messages. They don't know how long your calls were. They don't know who's in your group chats. All this information they're not collecting, um, which means that it is also information that they're not able to share um, with investigators. So um, if I'm going to my risk assessment and I'm concerned about legal requests or I'm concerned about metadata harvesting just in terms of you know, surveillance capitalism, then I oh, I'm sorry, we had technical difficulties. Um, we are at time. Is there any way you can uh, wrap up with some closing audio thoughts, Olivia, um, and we will take special care to clip this and include what we did not get to um, in the event summary email. Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, so I guess the, um, the sort of the long and short of it is that uh, there are, you know, these series of questions that, um, that we might want to ask or things to look for when trying to, you know, make an informed decision about the right um, secure communication tool for um, um, a given context, because it's all going to be dependent on that um, particular context. Um, and that's also how we use our risk assessment to, um, uh, to uh, influence um, our, our thinking and our decision making um, throughout, you know, all aspects of, of, our, of our digital security plan. Um, we have, um, if Ryan didn't uh, plop this in the chat already, we also have a series of secure communications guides um, for uh, not only Signal and WhatsApp. So, you know, if you're going to add those into your toolkit, uh, you'll want to look at, you know, how to enhance their privacy with some, and security with some settings changes, um, you know, so you can work like a pro and additional guides on um, more secure communications tools that um, 
that kind of uh, when you want to take the next step in your digital security journey, um, you might want to explore. So that's a really, really useful resource. All of those guides were put together by, um, you know, my colleagues at FPF. We're super proud of them. And um, and I, uh, I want to thank everyone for listening and hanging out and for your participation. If you heard some uh, some topics and concepts that you really want to explore um, more deeply, you can um, reach out to um, to Ryan or to me or um, fill out an, uh, a training request form if that's kind of the avenue that you want to follow on freedom.press um, slash training. So that's, you know, especially if you're you're working um, in media and you want some, you know, digital security support for you and or your team. Um, we do have a questionnaire to drop um, for those of you who have still hung out. Um, it's really just useful. I know we didn't, um, we had a little bit of a technical difficulty there at the end, but if you could give me any feedback about the way that um, things were paced and structured, it's really just useful fodder for me as I um, continue to try to learn new ways to, um, to share this material with people. So um, if you can uh, take a couple minutes to, to fill that out, all the questions are completely optional. So any feedback is welcome. And I, th I think with that, I'm, I'm feeling feeling good about uh, closing closing it up and, and tying a bow on it. Thank you so much, Olivia. Um, my email is membership at freedom.press. I believe yours is first name Olivia at freedom.press. Yep. yep. You can email either one of those. I did drop that survey. I'll also include that in the post event summary. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.